how much patience we have. That is the subject for today. So we will begin with the uh, opening prayer. So I will be asking my little helpers to start coming forward. So we can bow our heads. We will begin with the uh, opening prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for everything you have gave us. Thank you for the things, for the food, for the water, for the clothes, for the sun, for everything. Thank you because we are here together. Thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. After our opening prayer, we will have our tithe and offering. So let's watch together this video about it. Putting God first can be difficult. In this video, we'll explore what we can learn from Abraham that will help us put God first in our lives today. Abraham was 80 years old when he left his rich and prosperous home to travel into the desert. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Who in their right mind would do such a thing? But God had called him, and Abraham decided to put God first. A few years later, though, Abraham began to lie to save his own life. Why did Abraham become so fearful that he stopped putting God first? The answer is time and connection. Having put God first yesterday does not automatically mean that you will put God first today. Unless we regularly surrender our life to Him by connecting with Him as the first thing every morning, we may stop trusting Him, leaving God in second place. Or worse, some of us become disappointed with God because our lives didn't turn out as expected. When we don't achieve everything we aimed for, it's easy to return to our own desires and fears. Abraham had the courage to challenge God and demand his promises be fulfilled. After all, he was promised a land and descendants. In Genesis 15, he says, Lord God, what will you give me? See now I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. You know, sometimes we need to have some serious conversations with God. You don't have to remain silent if you have a few things to say to your Heavenly Father. Are you disappointed? Tell Him. Do you feel alone when He promised to be with you? Tell Him, as Abram did. So, God invited Abram to leave his tent and head towards a new direction. It was almost as if the Lord was telling him, your tent ceiling isn't large enough to accommodate what I can do if you look upward and put God first. It was by accepting this promise that his name was changed to Abraham. And his desire to trust and put God first led to the first biblical reference to tithing. Abraham chose to put God first, and his example compels us to do the same. As we return the tithe and promise, we are challenged to put God first. All right, so with that note, I would like to pray for the um, tithe and offering. So let's bow our heads. Thank you, Father, for your blessings, for your the income that you provide, food, our shelter, everything that you provide for us, mercifully, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, sharing and listening to your word. I ask, Father, that you bless each and every single person that can keep your tithe and your offering back to you. And also a blessing for those who are not able to do it, Father. We know that there are difficulties, struggles, but we ask, Father, that you keep your promise and help us to also fulfill our part of the promise. Help us return what is yours and help us manage what you, we keep, Father. Thank you for everything, Father. We ask everything in Jesus' name, amen. Now we will continue with the uh, scripture reading for today. When thou shalt thou make the ark and in and, and a cup it shalt thou finish it, Above and 
and the door of the archal top set the side of thereof with lower second and third stories shall thou make it. Amen. Now we will have our song of meditation. And I hope you all be able to uh, keep a straight face with it. And if not, if you want to join it, it will be good too. John and his kids were having fun in there. And uh, I hope everybody was able to either join or at least make a little smiley face with it. All right, so now we will begin our sermon for today. And for that, I will ask everybody to um, close your eyes and we will start with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Weather is very beautiful. It's not cold. It's not too warm either. But it is a nice, beautiful Sabbath day. I thank you for having us here, Father. I ask, Father, that you will open the hearts and the minds and the ears of everybody here and in the future listening to this. And at the same time, Father, I ask that you will take me out and you will only use me. Open my mouth and you will be able to speak through me. I ask everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody, again. I hope that we are all enjoying this beautiful Sabbath and uh, we will be able to um, reflect a little bit on a little word that I was able to uh, be inspired today. Um, with that opening song and with the uh, scripture reading, I'm sure everybody knows um, what are we gonna be talking about and about who we will be talking about as well. Um, this week, I decided to take a week off from work, which it didn't seem too different from most of the other weeks. Um, I had a list of chores that I wanted to do and accomplish, but um, um, I tried to make a list and everything. However, as probably some of you may have also go through, um, you know, the first day comes in, goes out, second day, third day, Sabbath comes, and then I look at that list and it seems like not too many things were completely accomplished on that week. Um, I know when you go on vacation, when you come back to work, a lot of people or some people at least will ask you, hey, how was your vacation? Um, I know mine was, I, I mean, I will answer it was short, not only because it's a short answer, but also because 
it seemed like it was too short. But probably somebody can relate to that, or at least I hope somebody does. Now, while I was doing that process, sir, this week, you know, um, something got me thinking about the keyword on today's title message. And that word is patience. Some people say that patience is a virtue. Some people say that patience is cultivated or you work on it. Some may say it is impossible, especially when you have young kids or ad adolescents. Um, sometimes they do test it a little too much, but that's what we will be talking about today. Now the Google definition is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. And that really looks a definition that has children in the background. For those parents and grandparents know what I'm talking about. Now, <clears throat> while I was preparing this uh, reflection today, I thought about different uh, people on Bible that have to endure patience. And I picture in my mind different scenarios and, uh, you know, as you read the Bible and Bible characters and stories, a lot have that word or that definition set down, like really to the ground. They know what patience means. They show it some a little delayed, some on time. Um, but I want to give you a little example, and then we will continue with Noah. Um, when most of your parents, when you have your first kid, you're usually nervous, right? It's a new experience, a new process, a new being coming into your home. Um, but usually when it's almost the due time, you really realize that you know nothing about it. And at least, for at least that was my, my case. So, you know, you, you ask your parents for advice. Hopefully if you're um, lucky, you will have grandparents to ask. They will probably give you other more wise food advice. Probably you know other parents that have been going through it. Probably you have books, maybe TV shows or the internet that you can look and research what you're getting into, right? Um, that then there is always somebody that will say, or at least somebody told me, hey, don't worry, you're not the first one that are going through it. And hopefully you won't mess it up, or at least not too much. I don't know if that was your case or not, but I found different advice and that was one of those. So now I wanna talk to you also about Adam and Eve. Who did they turn for advice? The parents, grandparents, people at work, other parents? Yeah, talk about facing something alone, right? Not only that, try to do some manual labor that you have never done before as Adam had to, to go through, right? In the garden, they had everything. The food was ready and we know that because... Okay, so we're back. So I was saying, um. Adam and Eve knew had everything in the garden. The Bible says that when he opened his eyes was on the sixth day. All nature, trees, fruit, food, everything was already done. Everything was there. He only had to lift up your, his, his arm, pick up the fruit or the vegetable and eat it, right? But when he was kicked out from the garden, I don't think that God just kicked him out and just 
telling me, hey, babe, do what you got to do, right? I know the Lord put the knowledge on him to do it, to start a garden and work on it. But now he had to learn about patience, you know, put it in the seed, put the seed in the, in the ground, water it, wait, wait, he has to grow. So I think that's part of patience. Um, I'm hoping that back in that time, the seeds were not like sometimes uh, or like the seeds nowadays, right? Sometimes and my wife and my kids have tried before and they put the seed, they water it and they wait and they wait and they wait and nothing grows out of that. Some people say those are bad seeds, right? But when you purchase the uh, little bag or with seeds, it doesn't say it comes with bad seeds or good seeds. It only say seeds. So how do you know if it is a good seed or a bad seed? But I'm sure back in Adam's days, those seeds were working good. So he didn't have to be disappointed too much with bad seeds. Now, that was just an example, like I say. So we are going to move into our story for today and our character for today, which is Noah. Noah, um, we know the story, the plot, Noah's life, a little bit before his um, encounter, direct encounter with the Lord. We know he was a righteous man in God's eyes. Uh, we know his family was trying to follow his example. And that was one of the reasons why the Lord chose him to do this uh, ark. Now, there is something that I also, as I was trying to get this uh, collection today, I noticed something. Um, I don't know if you have noticed it before too, but from Adam, who is in chapter one and two in the Bible, to uh, Noah, who is in chapter six, it looks like a very short period of time, right? I mean, we're still in the first book of the Bible and it only goes from chapter one to chapter six. When we're talking about creation and first man, first couple, first people on earth to, hey, a flood that is going to destroy all life on earth. And I know that after Adam and Eve, we have all the reasons and we can make all and any mistakes to deserve that. But it seems like, I mean, if you look at the Bible, it's quite a few books, quite a few pages. It tells the story of the entire human race from the beginning to the future end. But only in six chapters is already talking about the destruction of the race itself, right? I mean, that was one of the things that I was looking at and I was like, wow, we really give God a lot of reasons for this. Now, we know the Bible says that God doesn't anger easily and that God is patient. And six chapters into the Bible, and he is already disappointed with us. And I was like, hmm. Now, if we continue today's description reading, I'm going to, it says, and I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. My son was reading the King James Version. 
and that's why it was a little difficult for him. But the New King James, James, James Version says, you shall make a window for the ark. You shall finish it a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in the inside. On, I mean, on its side, I'm sorry. You shall make it with the lower, second, and third decks. Now, I choose this verse because it shows a lot from that big story, that verse really touched me this week. And I would like to divide it into uh, three different parts. Okay. Uh, the first part will be, uh, we will be talking about the window. Second part, we will be talking a little bit about the uh, door. And the third part, which is the three decks, uh, we will not be touching much about it for today. So the first part says, uh, you shall make a window for the ark. Now, and, and you shall finish it a cubit from above, okay? Now, as I said before, we all know the story. We know how big and marvelous and monumental this ark was, right? It was a miracle also that the animals were able to go in. Um, LNGY says that the angels led the animals the same amount, I mean, the exact amount as the Lord asked for them. They went in and everybody was able to fit, hopefully with a little room, right? I'm hoping. Um, now, Noah was commissioned to build that monumental ship, right? Not too many eyes have been able to see it after the flood. I'm sure Noah and his family were able to see it. I'm sure probably his descendants probably a little bit saw it. But after that, not too many eyes have been able to see it, correct? Now, it says that it had three decks, three floors, three levels, right? Um, and some Bible versions say that they have a basement, a first floor, and a second floor. So it kind of relates to mall or some houses that we can still see today around, right? Basement, first floor, and a second floor. Now, what is really interesting is that in that huge building, in that monumental arc, it says only one window. Just one. Now, I have been able to uh, see um, many ships, many buildings. Uh, most of them have windows. And as a matter of fact, I will say many windows, right? Um, and the ship, those big windows, especially at the bridge area, they kind of give you a guarantee that you will get to a safe destination. And hopefully there is somebody trained that will get you to a safe, safe port or at least to a safe place. So one window in that big place. Um, even in our houses, some, place, some, some houses have one window every other room. Some houses have one or two windows in each room. Some houses that I have seen look like the whole house is made out, out of a hole with just one window. Doesn't, have any, doesn't even have walls, just everything is glass. But this huge arc, Bible says only has one single window. Now, 
by as per the Bible definition, it says that anti-diluvian people, they had some great degree of intelligence. Um, I'm sure they, their science department was really advanced, right? They had a lot of um, developments, uh, advancement, advancements, and I have even heard a lot of people speculate that they had a lot of technology even to decode the human gene and some, you know, like DNA and things like that. They were able to uh, decode that. I don't know if it's true or not, but I have heard many people say that it could have been one of the reasons why. Now, <clears throat> The reason, uh, we, I mean, I, I don't think that back on that day, they had la moon landings or animal or human clones like we have now, but people say that there was a lot of advancements back in that time. Now, the reason why I say that is because with all that intelligence that they had at the, back then and with all the developments they may have. I'm pretty sure that Noah was not able to feed a HVAC system or a air purified system inside the ark to make it work with that single window. And I know that because I'm sure that window was not energy efficient certified. So I don't think it was able to uh, function for that. So why do we think that that was the specification for that window, that the Lord only asked for one window all the way up there? Mm -hmm. Well, um, again, I ask the question, why is it that in a huge arc, only one window all the way up in the third floor? Now, I want to picture something on your mind. I'm sure you will be able to uh, picture it really quick. Um, have you ever been outside in a farm, you know, or near a farm in an open air, breezy day? I'm sure in my experience, I can point to you very quickly. Where is it that most of the animals and especially the cows have been doing their businesses because the smell is really, really pointing to it. Even on a breezy day, you know, open space, open wide area. But in that arc was only one window. So imagine how that must feel. And we are talking still about patience. <clears throat> now, if you think about it, knowing his family, they didn't have anywhere else to go, right? Literally, they had no place to go. They couldn't even ask to go to a convenience store and just buy an air refreshment, right? Nothing. No option. No, nothing whatsoever at that point. Once the door was closed, it was closed. Nothing was going in or out. Only that window, right? The Bible never said that it was closed. The only thing that it was closed was the big door. So we can probably say that he let air sometimes, maybe a little water as well. Maybe they use it to collect water and drink out of it. We can only imagine and speculate about it, right? Now, the Bible does say that for 40 days and 40 nights straight, there were torrential rains and thunders and water motion and probably motion sickness as well. And a lot of things that they were probably expecting, but they didn't know about. Right? Right? Now, at this point, I want you to consider something. Noah 
Bible says that he was 600 years old when he and his family went inside the ark. I mean, I don't know if back then that was the time for a midlife crisis. Maybe he was still young. Or maybe like some people today may say, hey, he was just studying his third youth time, right? I have heard people say that when, when they're getting or past certain age, you know, retirement, something like that, they start saying, hey, you know, I'm in my third youth. You know, I'm just renewing. I'm starting to live now. Okay, but 600 years for our standards, that sounds really, really old. That sounds like a lot of time. So I don't know back then if that was middle or towards the end of your life, but we know he was 600 years old. Now, if you and your family have to go inside an ark for enduring 40 days and 40 nights of just constant rain, um, we have seen in different movies or most of the movies that I have seen about the ark, usually they show that during those first day or couple of first days, there was a lot of yelling and screaming for people trying to get inside. People trying not to die, trying to survive, right? Um, Bible says that, or I'm sorry, not Bible. The LNGY says that the there were some people that tried to survive, <clears throat> claiming to um, try strapping themselves to a tall, robust, big trees that they had back in the in, in that time. Right? Some people tried to go to the top hills, to the top of the mountains. And there was some people that tried to strap themselves to a big animals. We may probably think about elephants, probably giraffe, or probably something like that, right? Um, trying to survive. They were just trying to make it because they still didn't try to um, get the concept of a flood as they have never seen one before. Even rain, they never had seen it before. Bible says that not even a rain was there. They only got water from the daily dew and the daily moist, which was almost unseen. But this was something completely out of no anything that they knew up to their to that point right one probably thing that I, I also was thinking was there probably was somebody who tried to um, utilize that one single window trying to get into the boat but the bible doesn't say that anybody make it inside the boat so I'm guessing that nobody was able to get into that window either, right? I mean, other than Noah and his family, that they were able to be saved. Now, the Bible says that after that, um, those 40 days and 40 nights, right, there was water remaining really high for another 150 days. So if we add 40 days of just raining and 150 more, we got 190 days, right? Um, then if we continue reading, it says that on the seventh month, the ark finally stopped. We don't know where it stopped, but it says that it stopped. But it was only until the 10th month that they were able to see the peak of the top mountains around them. So they still have, were able to use that window to peek outside from time to time, right? So it was definitely not a sealed window. 
Now, if we add that, those 190 days plus, if it is saved from the seventh month to the 10th month, that means three months. So that will be about 90 days. We're giving it 280 days and counting that they were inside the ark, right? But the Bible says that it was his, it was past Noah's 601 birthday when they came out. So it was a whole year that they were inside the ark. Even though we always know and we always talk about 40 days of rain and 40 days only. But there was actually a whole year that they were inside the ark. A little over one year. Now, we can start getting an idea that this ceremony is not for someone who doesn't like to be safe in a closed area type space, you know, someone that is claustrophobic. Because I want you to think and try to imagine how was it inside that ark. I want you to use your imagination, hopefully not too wild, and hopefully that we keep it um, Christian, we can say, right? I mean, we can say that it was a noisy place. Most animals are noisy. And if you are kind of in a surround sound of, as wood is, it will probably increase the sound a little bit, right? But with all those intelligence and advances that they have back then, I'm pretty sure that they did not have those Bose noise cancellation headsets for a really quiet sleep night, right? I doubt they had those back then. Um, I imagine that they had to clean the animals quite often and all of them. Otherwise, that smell will not be pleasant. So they had to keep it on a minimum. And maybe that was one of the reasons why they had that window to be able to get rid of all the uh, trash and the waste that everybody was making. Maybe, right? Now, I can only imagine how much food they were able to get inside the ark. Now, sometimes I wonder, did God told Noah, hey, I want you to pack lunches, hopefully breakfast too, for you, your family, all the animals, and make it about one year. Maybe more, maybe less, but about a year. Do you think that God told Noah that? How did Noah know how much food to get inside the ark? I mean, he was able to preach and work on the ark for 120 years. The Bible says that he preached and he built the ark for 120 years, right? Did he have any idea they were going to be inside of that place for one, for over one year? Did he thought that he was going to run out of food at one point? Maybe he tried to put a little, a little garden inside the uh, ark so he can put a little veggies or little fruit or something intake just in case they ran out of food. Did he try to use that little window for fishing? Have we ever asked any of those questions before? To ourselves or do we really only believe that the Lord multiplied whatever provisions they were able to pack inside the ark for them and for the animals for that long period of time 
because obviously they were not able to stop by in the grocery store to buy anything extra in case they ran out of something, right? Now, another question, do you think that they argue inside? I mean, I have two kids and there is not a single day that I don't see them arguing over nothing because it is trivial what they argue about all the time, right? So imagine three, having had three kids, but you may say, hey, you know, they were no longer kids. They were adults and they were married. So now we have to add that factor too. We have three adults with three women on board, their wife, right? So was there any argument in there? A time, maybe frustration? Hmm. Now, do you think that at one point did they stop and think, hey, I feel a little lonely here. I feel a little depressed. You know, it's only three decks and four walls that I can see all day, all night, and every single day in and out. And only one window to look outside. And outside is only water. Do you, we really think that they were joyful, happy faces during the time inside the ark? I mean, I'm sure they were thankful. Yes. They were saved physically and spiritually up to that point. The Lord saved them, provide for them, right? But they were they really smiling, happy faces all the time within each other. Did they appreciate each other's help and company? I mean, they didn't have any, any other company, right? I'm sure they got to a point where they were really organized because like somebody said, you cannot run a tight ship if it's not organized. It wouldn't be a tight ship, right? Were they always that tight and organized? Did they train to be like that? In the previous flood, or did they ask anybody else on the previous flood how to behave on this flood? But wait, this has been, this one is the only flood that we're talking about, right? There was nothing before that prepared them. Even those 120 years that Noah was preaching, they didn't know what they will be facing during that year that was coming, right? So we can definitely say that they did not know what they were doing for some time. Eventually, everybody was able to pick up their duties and be able to do and clean and be able to get organized, right? Everybody eventually got good on their duties and their chores and everybody was able to put their best effort and everything. But... After all of that, back then there was no parches, no chess, no nothing to entertain yourself. It wasn't even Jeopardy back then to watch, right? So I want to ask, are we starting to get the picture that it has not been pictured? inside before. Does that picture may sound familiar to you? Maybe a little closer to home? Yeah, maybe. We may start thinking about what we, what we have been facing during the past few months, right? We have been in our homes. We have been close quarters with our relatives, right? But there are some differences in there, right? At least we have more than one window. 
to look outside, right? We have our homes, our families. We have a telephone that we can call people. We still have Zoom like this that we can still meet and greet other people. Uh, some people may say, I'm sure the pastor will be happy to hear FaceTime and iPhones for that. No, I didn't have any of that. They couldn't even contact anybody. And we know that because the Bible says they were the only ones. So they could not contact anybody outside the ark. But wait, they were able to. They were able to contact God. They were able to call upon the Lord. And I'm sure that even though there was only one window, the Lord was in there. Ellen G. White says that the strongest angels were outside holding that ark through the tempest and through the rain and through the thunder and through everything that they had to go through. Angels were holding that ark the entire time. And that was good. I think I want to believe that that was good. So now I want to move really quick to the second part that we wanted to talk about. And um, because the time is running out. So the second part of the verse today says, <clears throat> set the door of the ark on its side. Again, one door. One and only one. And the reason why I'm going to be short with this, because there is a very important application and a very important definition for just one door. <clears throat> and I read the other day about it, and it is simple. That door represents Jesus. Bible says Jesus is the only way to the Father. He's our only salvation, our only hope. And for knowing his family, that single door in the ark was a symbol for hope as well. Only one way in and out of that ark, the same way as how Jesus is our only door into heaven and out of this world. A new, a way to eternal life, a way to a new life, a way to a salvation and a much better future, right? That is the reason why there was only one door and it was shut and opened by the Lord only. Unlike the window, the window was kind of always open or kind of closed. And as we, as I said before, time is closing. <clears throat> I don't know how, how many Noahs we have in our midst today. And I say that because I want each and every single one of us to take this Noah story personal. I would like that each and every single one apply this story to our life, to our families, that we can believe that we, that the God of heaven have commissioned us to build, maybe not an ark, but a safe place for us and our kids to make sure that we only have one and only one door to salvation. And that door has to be our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make sure that our families go through that heavenly door and into eternal life. Noah was able to preach and build that ark for 120 years. He and his family were inside the ark. And I said it before, for over a year. And then they moved to a new earth. It was basically new everything, right? 
They were saved thanks to the Lord and the angels that provided for them. And that their story have been able to be foretold up to our generation, and I'm sure for many generations to come, and I'm sure up in heaven, we will still be able to talk about that story. And I hope that we will be able to uh, ask Noah himself, how did they actually be, were able to manage? And maybe answer some of the questions that I put out today. Or maybe they're not really relevant to speak about it in heaven. But I want also to uh, ask each and every single one of us to be able to tell our stories, how the Lord has been able to hold us through our difficult times, our good times, our lonely and sad times through our life and be able to be able to foretell those stories for the heavenly beings and for everybody else and our testimonies into the Lord and in, into heaven, be able to take it up there, be able to tell those stories. It is my prayer that you will be faithful and righteous as Noah was in God's eyes so we can be able to find grace and be able to cover, be covered by the blood of the Lord. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> we will be closing. And our closing song. Let's bow our heads for our closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for giving us your word today. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect upon it. I ask, Father, that you help us to be able to do your work, be able to uh, Provide and build that ark that you ask to be able to take ourselves and our families to the heaven, Father. I will ask that you can be able to follow that door that your son Jesus is. That we can be able to go through that door and be able to meet you one day. I ask that your word, be your, your blessing will be with us today and during, during that this new week that we'll be starting. I ask that you stay with us and that you never leave us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.